All right, all right, everybody. Can you hear me? Perfect. Well, thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, I'm Lou Parati. I'm the uh, president of the board of directors for the Rhode Island Natural History Survey. And on behalf of the entire board and uh, staff of the survey, again, uh, we want to thank you for coming out. And uh, we welcome you in uh, celebrating tonight's uh, award recipients. Um, these, awards, these awards mean a lot to the survey. Um, the people who receive them exemplify what the survey stands for. Um, so we're really proud to, to give these awards out and really proud of the folks who have received them um, past and present. Um, and uh, lastly, we'd love to thank you guys for all the support that you give to the survey throughout the year, through your memberships, uh, attending our events, generous donations, um, and if you're not a member, uh, we encourage you to join because it's uh, quite a bargain for the buck. Um, a lot of great um, events throughout the year um, that are enjoyable and fun for the whole family. And again, connect people uh, to wildlife and wild places. So without further ado, let's get the program going. I'm going to introduce Keith Kellingbeck. Uh, he's going to come up and MC our program this evening. And again, welcome and thank you for joining us tonight. Hi, everybody. So what I'd like to do to start the evening uh, is to talk a little bit about the awards that we have so that you know what the, not only what they are, but what went into the decisions that, that we've made. So um, and I'll go through the four awards. So the first one that I'll talk about is the Exceptional Service Award. And this is the most recent award that the Rhode Island Natural History Survey has come up with. And the award acknowledges persons or organizations that have made exceptional contributions of one of many things, time, money, expertise to the survey. And this award, again, is relatively recent, 2020. So we have three recipients, Sharp Family, Joyce Valentine, Kenny, and last year, Helen Lucy. the Golden Eye Award. And this award recognizes a person for making one or more particularly notable discoveries, natural history observations in a given year. And this was begun in 2008. So we have 10 recipients so far for this award. And I should point out None of these awards are necessarily annual. We don't have, the survey does not have to present any one of these in any given year. It turns out that we have so many talented naturalists that it never seems to be a problem. <clears throat> so the Distinguished Naturalist Award, and, and I'll just say there, there are two types. There's posthumous and then living, and I'll talk about that in a second. But there are three criteria that we use, that we being the Natural History Survey, use to select recipients. Persons who've made significant contributions in the advancement of the scientific knowledge of Rhode Island's organisms, geology, ecosystems, and or the person is recognized as an outstanding educator to students and the public on Rhode Island's biota and natural systems, and or made significant contributions in enhancing public awareness of the importance of Rhode Island's biota and natural systems. And again, the and or is really important. And it turns out, it, at least as I, as I look back on the uh, awardees from the past, so many of them, have checked the box on all three of these criteria. It, it's, it's really quite amazing. In 2000, we began the posthumous award for distinguished naturalist. And these are the 19 recipients to date. And we're gonna add one tonight. And then the original Distinguished Naturalist Award, which was begun in 1995, and we have 28 
recipients already. And if you, I'm not going to read all these, but if you look quickly at that list, there are amazing recipients. It's a, an incredibly talented group. Two of these folks we lost this year. And uh, yeah, I, I see heads shaking. So um, Hugh Willoughby, who was the 2003 Distinguished Naturalist, and more recently, 2017, it was Fran Underwood. Underwood. Hugh was 91 and was still playing table tennis. Marty, that's for you. <laughs> and and I, I, I just learned from Don Heitzman earlier tonight that Hugh's table tennis table has now been transported to the Caratunk Audubon Refuge. So if you ever have the need <laughs> to either see his, see his memorabilia in terms of in, in the form of a table tennis table or play some table tennis, that's where it is. Uh, Hugh gave the most hilarious acceptance speech ever of all of our recipients for the Distinguished Naturalist Award. I, I wish we had a recording of it. It was, it was amazing. And, you know, I'm looking at, at Fran here and just look at that smile. What a, what a sweet person. And both of them were just incredible naturalists. We are so lucky in, in this small state to have so many talented people. Now, the first award this evening, <laughs> oh, who's shaking their head? The first award this evening is the Golden Eye Award. And for the Golden Eye Award, we need an eye doctor, right? Yeah. And so it's Dr. David Gregg. And you'll notice, I, I don't know if you can see this or not, um, this, <laughs> this eye chart. <laughs> Uh, doesn't show up. That eye chart is pretty funky. I'm not sure what that shows. But the other thing is that there, somebody sent him a little birthday card there because it seems to me two days ago was your birthday. So happy birthday. Okay, thank you, Keith. Um, you know, some of us strive to... Um, win a distinguished naturalist award or get a golden eye and others of us, we, our ambition is to get a photo shot by Keith Killingback. <laughs> so check. Um, yeah, so I am going to present the golden eye and um, you know, if you think, well, maybe we should buy a Blitz Mordor, right? Uh, one uh, Dark Lord, a giant spider, nine ring rays, two hobbits. Um, but um, we're talking about a different kind of eye. We're talking about um, a naturalist who finds something interesting, curious, amazing, unique uh, out there, and doesn't just say, eh, it's, your, it's interesting, and then keep it to themselves. The whole process is very much what we want to have everybody do um, in the natural history survey and, and in the whole community. So first of all, you have to see the thing and recognize that it's not the same as all the other things. You need a level of curiosity, a level of acuity to see something and see difference. And you have to persevere because it's highly likely you will have a struggle to identify whatever it is. You need taxonomic knowledge. You've got to, even if you don't know it, you've got to find the right person to figure out what it is. Might require some resourcefulness, maybe making an appointment in a, in, at a, a university or something to, to go and show your discovery to. Maybe uh, email me at the National History Survey. Maybe we can help you. Um, record keeping. If you don't write it down, it never happens. Uh, and communication, because if you don't tell people what you found, it's like you never found it. And so, and when we all benefit from what each of us discover when we share it. And that's kind of 
one of the ideas of the natural history survey is a, a venue and opportunity to create those connections. So um, these are the, the steps for good natural history and some of the recipients over the years. Uh, that's unusual. What is it? What does it mean? Who might want to know? And so this year's recipient is Silas Claypool, who discovered a mushroom that had not been seen in Rhode Island before. Boletus bilii, is that right? Yeah. So uh, I would like to present the 2003 golden eye to Silas Claypool. And here's a plaque for you. And we have something else for you too. Here is a copy of the Mycota of Rhode Island by Roger Goose, published by the Natural History Survey. And it has a bowie stamped on the cover. Hello, everyone. Hello. So um, I want to thank the Rhode Island Mycological Society specifically Dina Tom Tempest Thomas, who will who was helped me on my journey to learn more about mushrooms and the mycological world. And thank Tracy Hall, who's in the Audubon and has gotten me interested in nature for three years. All right. And uh, to um, introduce the next award, I would like to call Ben Gagliardi. Ben is on our board of directors. Uh, he is a biologist and collections manager at the um, Edna Lawrence Nature Lab at RISD. Ben. Thanks, David. I had to follow three wonderful uh, speakers. Ah, the clicker. Uh, but I'm going to restrict myself to this script. Otherwise, I'll wax poetic ad nauseum and get tongue tied. Um, so I'm. Oh, the clicker. Yes, you just pointed it out. Don't need to see me anymore. <laughs> uh, tricky. So I'm, I'm thrilled uh, to be presenting this Distinguished Naturalist Award in honor of Anna W. Lawrence, who you see there, posing in this uh, now famous localized photo of her that we have posted all over the, the RISD Nature Lab. Uh, okay, I'm learning. How am I doing now? Much better. Okay. Okay. Perfect. So um, she is a woman who I have never met, but whose influence, vision, and legacy I'm surrounded by every day. Uh, I've been working at the Nature Lab for seven years now as the collections manager. Um, I'm likewise happy uh, with this opportunity to share a little bit more about her with those of you who might not be familiar. And it sweetens the whole affair that I get to do this a mere few days away from what would have been her 125th birthday on Monday, I believe. Um, I'm also very grateful to have Edna's grandniece, great niece, I don't remember the, the proper term for this, um, Jeanette Dibois, who's come all the way from Cape Cod to accept the award on her behalf and to tell me if I've got any facts wrong. Um, so Edna Winifred Lawrence, or Miss Lawrence, as uh, I learned from her students, she preferred to be addressed, was the founder and now namesake of the Edna Lawrence Nature Lab at Rhode Island School of Design. She graduated from RISD in 1920, and after that, she traveled the world for a couple of years, mostly alone on freight liners, as you do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, she was collecting specimens and little treasures from around the world, and she returned um, a couple of years later to join the RISD faculty in 1922. Um, nature drawing is the class that we most associate with her with at the Nature Lab, but she also talked cast drawing, life drawing, sketch in action, freehand and mechanical perspective, watercolor drawing and painting for architects, foundation drawing, 
portrait drawing, still life painting and museum research. She was quite skilled in many uh, disciplines. <clears throat> Uh, so, but so throughout her first 15 years teaching at RISD, she kind of traveled around using any classroom she could. In 1937, she was given the old library space in the Waterman building, which she proceeded to fill with all the specimens that she'd collected in her own uh, natural history collection of uh, about uh, 1,300 uh, specimens and cultural artifacts. And this nature laboratory, as she called it, was a completely unique concept. And, uh, an interactive reference collection that gave art students hands-on access to natural history items. Um, she wanted it to be a place where visitors could study specimens for what she referred to as design content and inspirational value. Um, the Nature Lab was her classroom, her unique domain, and sustaining it and growing it was a driving passion for her. So every summer, after teaching, she would uh, add to her collection with specimens that her and her partner, Bessie Stone, gathered while traveling across the country and across the world. And Edna, I'm just, do I have a second picture? One more, one more. Oh, there's a good one. As a teacher, that's a very good picture. Um, Edna explained that she started uh, filling the lab with things she picked up herself, and then other people started to give her more stuff. Um, and her collection grew to 25,000 specimens by the time she retired in the 1970s. Uh, and today, the Nature Lab's collection approaches 100,000 individual specimens. We, keep, we count every little seed pot and everything like that. <laughs> um, but um, we often re recite this quote from, from uh, 1941 that elegantly summarizes what the Nature Lab's mission is. And it's, the goal is to open students' eyes to the marvels and beauty in nature of form, space, color, texture, design, and structure, and to help them realize the functions and reasons for nature's creations. Uh, that goal is something that she very much, much succeeded in. Uh, in her 53 years of teaching at RISD, she inspired countless students uh, to understand and appreciate and be curious about nature and instructed them also how to observe closely and patiently and depict accurately and artfully. Um, Edna was a truly forward-thinking woman, and there isn't a day go that goes by at the Nature Lab that we, the, the small staff of five or six people now, um, that we don't stop to recognize and admire her ambition in launching a completely unique research facility and cross-disciplinary collaboration space um, that, that breaks, it sort of breaks the rules of many similar places. It looks like a natural history museum, but we let you open the doors and take stuff out and touch stuff. And we even check out specimens like library books, unheard of elsewhere. Um, so Miss Lawrence may not have a background in biology or life sciences, though she was a member of the Audubon Society in Rhode Island field naturalist, but as a keen eyed artist, a specimen collector and preparator, uh, and a, most importantly, a tireless and impactful uh, instructor who worked far outside the box, she has had a major impact on generations of students who attended RISD and then went off to the art and design world with a deeper appreciation and understanding of the natural one. Um, I can speak on behalf of all the Nature Lab staff in expressing what a privilege it is to be a stewards of Edna's lab and concept. We continue to grow the collection and use it in new ways. Uh, we've expanded our resources to include a state-of-the-art microscopy lab with NSF-funded equipment and a biodesign maker space as well. I, I hope that it, it, Edna's somewhere thinking, wow, that's, I can't believe how far it's gone. Um, I do sometimes stop and wonder what she would think of her legendary status at the Nature Lab, uh, this place that she founded. How would she feel if she knew that some iteration of her name is the password to many of our computers at work. <laughs> and that photos of her serve as a profile image on Flickr and iNaturalist accounts. I'm sure she'd have pretty mixed feelings. Um, I, and just one last little tidbit. Um, I'm, so I'm trained in entomology and always striving to be a, improve as a naturalist, a lifelong goal shared by many people in this room. However, I think it's crucially important to, uh, that we remember we all enjoy different access and ability to experience nature. Um, what might be mundane for some can be exceptional for others. So just a quick sort of thought experiment. Um, in your mind, imagine you're holding a 
fir tree pine cone. You can imagine its shape, its, its lightness, its size, its dryness, that delicate flicking sound when you run your finger down the, the scales. Now, um, imagine a whelk shell. You could feel the heft of it in your hands. You could sense where its center of gravity is, feel that smooth interior surface, the knobs and spires of the spiraling apex and the deep fluted siphon canal at the opposite end. How poetic. Um, <laughs> for most of us, the, these two things, they're common, especially in Rhode Island. Um, and we've probably spent time handling these out of our own curiosity. Uh, we have tactile memories of the sensations of observing these things with our fingers. For others, these simple experiences and the time to thoughtfully engage with these objects could be brand new and potentially unforgettably impactful. And that's what Edna Lawrence as an instructor in her nature lab as a resource have achieved so powerfully for so many. Uh, I think that a key characteristic of any great naturalist is inspiring the curiosity of others. And for that, I am so pleased to recognize Edna Lawrence with this distinguished award. And Jeanette will accept it. Love to hear from you. <laughs> it's a very big award. <laughs> a very big award. I am neither an artist nor a naturalist, um, but it's really an honor to be here. I did not think of her as either of those things for a very long time. She was just Aunt Edna and Aunt Bessie. They were kind of this this grouping of two people that um, I grew up really being inspired by in a couple of ways. Aunt Edna taught me to look in the heart of things, um, whether it was part of a seashell that she was sketching or a woman walking down a, a road in a Caribbean island. Um, she looked for the heart of whatever it was she was drawing. And she taught me and my sister to do the same. And the other thing was that she just taught me, and this is entirely by action. She never lectured us. I don't know what she was like as a professor because she didn't lecture us. Um, but she did teach me that you can dare to do things that you don't think you can do. Um, the two of them traveled all over the world in the 1920s when young women did not travel alone. They had all sorts of adventures, which they all put down to, oh, well, those other people don't understand us, um, which didn't even go in my head, but should have probably because <laughs> she, was, she was such a fabulous role model. But mostly she was a person who lived in this house, and, and I believe you when you say all these artifacts came from there because their house was crammed with stuff, with, with skeletons of bats and birds, um, bizarre, bizarre things, shells and rocks and flowers and dried things that I don't even know what they were and probably don't know, want to know what they were. Um, but she did capture, I think, a lot of the things that have become meaningful to me as an adult. And I am so honored that um, you think the same of her. Thank you so much for nominating her. And thank you for the award. And now I get another privilege to hand over the microphone to Kyra Stillwell. <laughs> All right, it's still on. I was going to go behind the podium, but I'm a little too short. So I'm gonna hang out here with Pete August. He's always good company. It's okay, it's not my favorite board, but that's okay. I am a surfer. Um, so thank you everyone for being here. Um, thank you for the opportunity to talk about one of my favorite people in the survey sphere, but uh, eat the mic. I learned that earlier today in another lecture. <laughs> and so, oh. Carl Sawyer. First, thank you to all the Carl fans who are here. <laughs> You know who you are. 
<laughs> Acknowledging Carl's earnest actions here this evening brings honor to the intent of the survey's Founders Award for Exceptional Service. Carl has been a member of the survey since our founding in 1994. Don't do the math. Yes, it's almost 30 years, six months. During this time, he's also been a consistent donor, responding to appeals and other asks for financial support, and an incredibly active, engaged member and stalwart supporter. I'm going to share with you my experience of Carl over the 19 years that I have been with the survey and have known him. Anyone who has attended a few survey events will have seen Carl. Annual meetings, lectures, conferences, award celebrations, like we're here for tonight, and of course, bio blitzes. If you've met Carl, or are one of many who call him a friend, you will have experienced his warmth and congeniality. Since our office moved to East Farm in 2015, we never know when Carl will wander in for a brief visit. Lucky us. It's always the high point of my day. He consistently takes the time to deliver his membership renewals, event registrations, etc., in person. And while he's visiting, before he leaves, he never fails to ask if there's anything that we need help with. Carl was a research associate at URI's Agricultural Experiment Station for almost 40 years. Early on, he was a colleague of botanist and Distinguished Naturalist Award winner, Dr. Irene Stuckey. The story has it that Irene was the inspiration behind Carl's interest in native and naturalized plants, as he was an accomplice on her roadside adventures. Carl was the driver, and Dr. Stuckey the eyes off to the side of the road, identifying plants. The rest of Carl's long-standing love of plants, both agricultural and native, is history. I'm sure many of you can tell that story much better than I can, and I would hope to hear some of those stories someday. Since Rhode Island Bio Blitz in 2007 at Trustum Pond in South Kingstown, which is just a few miles as the crow flies from where Carl lives in Matumic Hills. Carl's been the captain of the plant team, affectionately known as the plant athletes. Due in part to his efforts, the task has evolved from reporting in the form of a long paper checklist, which was probably, I don't know, 100 pages, something like that, to a computer-based list, which includes regular updates to the taxonomy, because there's the lumpers and the splitters and all the name changes that happen in plant taxonomy. Carl spends time readying materials in advance of each year's bio blitz, engaging with team members before they arrive, strategizing inventory coverage for all areas and habitats on each of the parcels, and when possible, conducts pre-event scouting. After the fact, he does QA and QC work on the vascular plant reporting list to ensure that it's accurate and complete. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with the vascular plants at BioBlitz, the average number of species is 322. So wrestling the list is no small feat. Every year since BioBlitz 2014, when we were at Rocky Point, it was back in the old days when our office space was still on the second floor of Ranger Hall, and a lot of our equipment was stored on the third floor and the fourth floor. Carl would come and we would go up the stairs to get the equipment and down the stairs to bring the equipment out to the vehicle and up the stairs to get <laughs> it and so on and so forth. Carl in his enormous bronze van has reliably provided transportation to and from BioBlitzes for the brunt of survey equipment and supplies since 2014. 
This predictable routine saves us precious time in pre-event planning and me lots more tinsel in my hair from the worry of how are we going to get it all there and get it all back. Like a well-oiled machine, Carl arrives on the Thursday afternoon prior to BioBlitz and we load up. Van stuffed to the gills, Carl is one of the first to arrive at the BioBlitz site on Friday morning. 30 hours later, after hours of setup, after hours at the plant athletes table, after hours in the field botanizing, and too few hours sleeping, Carl, a volunteer, helps heave everything back in the van and is the last to leave. Setting the team aside, he proceeds, along with David and me, and sometimes a couple other helpers, back to East Farm to unload all of the gear. With never a complaint, Carl completes his task, bids us goodbye with his warm and genuine smile. He never fails to share attaboys for a job well done, a reminder to enjoy the rest of the weekend, and thanks for our hard work. Carl is invaluable as part of a team. His general disposition, soft-spoken, good-natured, considerate, and humble, set the tone for all. A quiet and keen observer, Carl always offers up his dry sense of humor at just the right time. Not only is Carl a botanist, a leader, an equipment lover, and a wonderful teammate, he's also handy. <laughs> I would be remiss if I didn't call out his knowledge of tools and all things mechanical, particularly generators, which has helped to keep us afloat in BioBlitz on more than one occasion. Carl D. Sawyer is the quiet one, often at the edge of the periphery, who gets things done while others are just talking about what needs to be done. It's my pleasure now to call Carl up to receive his Founders Award for Exceptional Service. So the, the Founders Award is Perpetual Plaque. Uh, Carl's uh, name is right here. And this hangs on, on the wall at the survey offices. So congratulations and thank you for everything. Okay, and let's see then. I, oh, <laughs> get to introduce the great Baron of Hope Valley, <laughs> or Dr. Peter August. Thank you. I'm going to use the podium mic. So we'll turn this one off. Um, and I have a couple of comments tonight to make on our uh, Distinguished Naturalist Award winner. So for me, it's a real privilege to present the 2023 Distinguished Naturalist Award to my friend and colleague, Dr. Peter Payton. Peter is a gifted scientist, a passionate teacher mentor to both graduate and undergraduate students and an exceptional storyteller. He is most deserving of the Natural History Survey's highest honor. Typically at this point in the presentation, I would spend a few minutes describing Peter's professional path, but Peter's gonna tell that story and you're gonna love it. Instead, I'm gonna highlight Peter's professional accomplishments here in Rhode Island and reflect back on Keith's comments about uh, the criteria for the Distinguished Naturalist Award. You're gonna see a lot of ands in, in Peter's. On scholarship, 
Peter is an exceptionally productive scientist. His primary areas of scholarship are the conservation of migratory shorebirds, movements and breeding of amphibians and vernal ponds, impacts of offshore wind turbines on migrating birds, and sea duck ecology. His statistics tell the story. Peter has published two books. The first, The Ecology of Block, the Ecology of Block Island, a natural history survey publication. This year, he published The Breeding Bird Atlas of Rhode Island. He's written nine chapters and books. He has authored 92 peer-reviewed journal articles. And I might note, when I looked at, at the journal papers he's published in the last 23 years, almost everyone includes a student author. As a full professor, Full professor, Peter has secured $12 million in grant funding from 15 different agencies. So it's not like he has um, one single funding source. He's, he has money coming in from all over the place. In 2003, he was awarded the College of the Environment and Life Sciences Research Excellence Award. On mentoring, I was a department chair in uh, natural resources when Peter was hired. All new faculty get reviewed each year for their first five or six years, at which point a tenure decision is made. I clearly remember one of our uh, annual review conversations. Peter had a particularly stunning year uh, with his research. I asked him what his goals were for the next year, and he simply said, to be the best teacher I can be. 30 years have passed since Peter and I had that conversation, and Peter, you succeeded. You met that goal in a spectacular way. Peter's core courses are field ornithology, wetland wildlife management, and management of migratory birds. His student evaluation scores are a perfect five out of five almost every semester for every class. As a full professor, he has mentored 15 master's students, MESM students, and PhD graduate students. He sits on scores of thesis and dissertation committees. Graduate students know Peter to be a very tough, but very fair examiner, and he's always constructive. He advises 25 to 40 undergraduate students each year. That's a load. In 2015, he was awarded the College Teaching Excellence Award. Peter's natural history knowledge is epic, as is contagious enthusiasm. We might see some of that tonight. One nominator wrote, and I love this, this statement, his excitement for nature is infectious. Seeing him as enthusiastic about spotting his 10,000th yellow warbler, <laughs> just as he was for the first time, never fails to thrill the students. On service, Peter is exceedingly generous with his time. At URI, he's had two tours of duty as department chair and has done every service assignment there is on campus. He's a past president of the Rhode Island Natural History Survey, reviewer for many scientific journals. He's on the editorial board for Northeastern Naturalist and an advisor to CRMC and DEM. He's a senior fellow of the Coastal Institute and science advisor for the stewardship of the Napa Tree Point Conservation Area, where Peter spent the whole day today at the annual science meeting for Napa Tree work. To conclude, to quote from one of Peter's letters of nomination, Dr. Payton has to rank among the top professors at URI and almost any metric you choose. And one of the most effective and dedicated naturalists in the state. His commitment to the profession of wildlife conservation, the university, his colleagues, his students, the citizens of Rhode Island, and most importantly, the science of natural history is unrivaled. We asked Peter to say a few words to all of us uh, but we imposed a few constraints. If you know Peter's science, you know he's a real quant jock. 
um, and very proficient in complex statistics. We told him he could not pre present pivot table results, that's his favorite tool, <laughs> or use the word akaiki information criteria, his favorite statistic. Instead, we asked uh, Peter if he would share with us the path he took to become the exceptional naturalist that he is. When he does, you'll see why I mentioned Peter is a master storyteller. I'm going to suggest to Dave and Kyra, we tweak the name of the DNA Award this year and call it the Triple DNA Award, the Dapper Dashing Distinguished Naturalist. <laughs> Congratulations, Peter, and please come up to accept your award. So we can get this to David, or, or do we just He's keep it right there? Switching over. <laughs> Oops, there's right there. Lights be turned it off. Uh, yes. Well, thank you so much for uh, coming tonight. I'm, let's use this microphone. Um, so it's my honor to be here, um, and thank you for the fantastic introduction. Um, so, so here's the outline of today's talk. I, I briefly, <laughs> briefly summarized, this is a natural it's a life history talk, so we have to talk about my genetic background, my age at first reproductive for my family, uh, reproductive last, uh, lifespan and aging and number of options, and you're thinking, holy crap, what am I doing here now? <laughs> I'm not going to do that. I'm going to just share some of my photographs. This is not photoshopped. This is a real picture. Um, <laughs> I just realized what it was. <laughs> um, it's like having a B-52 fly over your class. <laughs> um, so my background, as you could gather, I'm Scottish. Uh, and actually, if you look at the background of my family, it's kind of the rise and fall of the British Empire. Um, and so my great grandparents on my father's side, um, he was actually a missionary in China. Um, and then on my mother's side, William and Lisa Ryan, they were in England, they had eight children. Um, so then my grandfather was a major general in the British Medical Service. And so he was born in China, um, but then he was raised in, Indi in India too. Um, and so he spent a lot of time in India and you can see he was a surgeon. Um, and then my grandfather on my mother's side was a real rear admiral and then served in the Pacific. Um, my father um, was born in, in India uh, when obviously my grandfather was there. Um, and um, so this is my father um, as a young child growing up in India. This is my um, my grandmother, um, and then um, this is my father. Um, I'm Peter William Calder Payton, so my father is Bruce Calder Payton, um, and so he was uh, um, actually when my grandfather was in India, he went to boarding schools in Scotland most of the time. So he was in boarding schools most of his life. He, he, uh, um, you know, and my mother grew up in uh, New Jersey and the East Coast. Um, she went to school in Berkeley, um, became eventually the, the secretary of staff to a Senator, Senator Ives in Washington um, and went to Beirut after that time. So kind of traveled around the world. So my parents actually met on the Queen Mary in 1953 when uh, when my father was going to do his residency in New York City, he, my father was a heart surgeon, 
And my mother was on a vacation apparently in Spain and they came back together and that's where they met. Um, uh, then I was uh, actually born in Edinburgh and, and I lived there for uh, two and a half years. And then my family migrated and we grew up in Denver, Colorado. So a fair amount of traveling in our, in our family. Um, I grew up with three brothers. I was the eldest in, in Denver. As I just mentioned, I went to Lewis and Clark College in, in Portland, Oregon, where I uh, took a bunch of biology classes. Um, and it was, I, given my, my family's background, I thought I was going to be a medical doctor. Um, but my grades told me I wasn't going to be a medical doctor. <laughs> and, but I remember specifically, I took an ornithology class spring tumor my junior year. And I learned how to identify Oregon. This is a subspecies of the dark-eyed junco. And I still remember that mem memory vividly that, that I, I could recognize a dark-eyed junco. And that got me really excited. Oh, maybe I could do something with birds. Um, and it ended up being my life. Who would have known? Um, so after I graduated, I went to a place called Mount Here Field Station, which is Eastern Oregon. I was a young hippie, as you can tell. So this is, that's me. Um, and so I learned a lot about field biology, uh, doing it at Mount Here Field Station. Uh, I got real, real much more excited about birds and decided I hitchhiked from Malheur, which is in Eastern Oregon, down to Point Reyes Bird Observatory, showed up the front door and I said, put me to work. I want to learn how to ban birds. And luckily they said, sure, come on in. So I spent six months at Point Reyes learning how to ban birds. Um, and that got me much more excited about it. And through that opportunity, that opportunity I got a chance to go to Hawaii um, to study forest birds in the Hawaiian Islands. So this is... Uh, and a kappa, the apapani, and my favorite, a kia palau, which has this really strange bill that the lower mandibles, like a woodpecker, upper mandibles used to pick out insects out of the park. So I was in Hawaii studying forest birds with the US Forest Service. And then I got a job with the Fish and Wildlife Service doing bird surveys around the island. And that means getting up, go doing transect surveys where you go out in the middle of the back country walk along a transect um, and do point counts where you stop every 100 meters or so and listen for birds and then go on to the next point count station. Well, one time when I was doing those transect surveys, it was in an area on the big island where the, it was waist deep fern. I didn't really see anything. The next thing I knew, I woke up, it was pitch black. I couldn't hear any birds. I knew I'd fallen down something, but I didn't know what had happened. And so I thought, well, it's going to get light. The people are going to find me and get me out. Well, long story short, um, I had actually fallen 130 feet down a vault, vault in a crack. Um, and luckily, they found me. And so I'm here to tell you about it, that I made it. <laughs> uh, so it was a bit of an ordeal, but I uh, got here. So after I recovered, um, I went and studied the Hawaiian hawk. Uh, for as a real a field research assistant and so got another some more experience in Hawaii um, and then I got a chance to study catalegris as an airstrike hazard at the airport in Hawaii Hawaii for my master and I turned that into my master's thesis from Colorado State University. After I got my master's thesis I went to Northern California and got looked at the effects of logging on wildlife populations and specifically spotted owls and marble murrelets. So again, working with the Forest Service, um, I did that for about four years. Um, so I got a lot of practical experience and decided I need to go back for my PhD. So I went from a, the old growth forest of the Pacific Northwest to the Great Salt Lake where there's no vegetation, where I studied the snowy plover for my PhD. Um, and, and that's where I met my wife. Uh, and so we got married in Oregon and she knew she got stuck with the birder because partway through the ceremony, there was a dipper singing in the background. And so I 
stopped the ceremony. I said, did you hear that dipper singing in the background? And the minister was like, what are you talking about? What's the problem? It's, it's just a bird. Uh, so after, after that, we fortunate to, I got a postdoc in Denali National Park designing uh, bird survey protocols for, in, for the national parks here. So when I interviewed for this job, I was in Denali, I interviewed with Frank Olette when I was, I was in Alaska. So then I got to URI and now I'll talk about things I've been doing at URI. Um, so my predecessor, Bill Edelman had been do, done, doing a lot of work with saltmarsh sparrows and that's this species looking at the population dynamics. And so I took over that study um, and did that for a number of years. Um, at the same time, I had a lot of interest in wading birds too. Um, so Carol Trock, he would, uh, took on a master's with me looking at wading bird foraging ecology um, in, in marshes around Rhode Island. So that was a big area of interest for me. Um, I have, I've always had tremendous interest in shorebirds. Um, and there, at Monomoy National Wildlife Refuge, there's a lot of interest in impacts of shellfishing, disturbance from shellfishing on shorebird populations. And so Steph Coach, who's a biologist with the Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, got a PhD with me um, looking at shorebird populations at Monomoy National Wildlife Refuge. And I should say that it's obvious, a lot of these pictures, one of my passions is taking photographs and I always like it, the chance to share them with people. Um, so these are some of the ones. What I really like is uh, in the upper right-hand corner is a semi-palmated sandpiper. And I like it when you can just be really patient have the bird just act naturally. And so it's, to me, it's special to just have a bird training when you're really next to it. So that's always exciting to me. Um, during this time period too, there's the Kingston Wildlife Research Station, which is one of the longest branding bird banding stations in North America. Doug Krause um, was a chemistry professor here who had started the banding station. So it's 85, 82 acres five minutes from campus. He bought the 82 acres for $5,000 in 1953. Um, but he banded birds every fall um, and he left it in down to the Audubon Society of Rhode Island. Um, and so it allowed us to start a bird banding operation. So we've been banning birds there every fall um, since 1998 um, and had a number of pieces come out of that. So that's been it. And we have, the nice thing about the bird banding station is we get a chance to take students to the bird banding station. So, so just like I, for me, that I like, um, I like the chance to give a chance, that students a chance to have that experience like I had with the dark eyed junko. So um, um, another thing that was really passionate to me was during the same time period, um, I was very interested in vernal pools. So we had a lot of uh, students looking at pond breeding amphibians in Rhode Island and looking at the movement dynamics and use of vernal pools throughout the state. So that was um, about eight years of my life was devoted to pond breeding amphibians. Um, and again, it's a very special experience for the, to get take students out in the field. To get, a lot of people have never walked around a vernal pool. And so I've always get really excited to give people a chance to, to see um, what life you can find in vernal pools and, and the looks on people's faces when they really get a chance to hold a, a frog for the first time or a snake for the first time, um, it's always really exciting. Uh, also during this same time period, as Pete mentioned, we got, there's a lot of interest. We didn't have the Block Island wind farm yet. There was something called the ocean sand. And so we wanted to design um, survey methods to figure out where the wind farm should go. Um, so we did some of the first offshore wind surveys in, in Rhode Island, um, and that eventually led to the development of the Block Island Wind Farm. Um, and we also, during that same time period, because of all the interest in sea ducks and potential impacts of offshore wind on sea ducks with my colleague, Dr. Scott McWilliams, uh, we did a lot of blue rate of telemetry on white wing scoters and black scoters and common eiders and looking at their movement dynamics. So that was uh, some really interesting times for us. Um, then also during this 
you know, I, I mentioned that I'd done my dissertation research on, on snowy plovers at the Great Salt Lake. Um, when I got here, I really wanted to study piping plover, which is a threatened species that nests on the beaches in Rhode Island. Um, but they, weren't, they wouldn't allow me to capture them and ban them when I first got here. Um, and then with Pam Moore and I, we got permission to put transmitters on birds to look at their movements in the offshore environment, to look at the potential impacts of offshore wind on piping plovers. And so it's my chance to really get back in the piping plover, in the plover world and so we, we banded them and really learned a lot about their movement dynamics. And that again was another special opportunity to work with a lot of great biologists. And if you're a plover biologist, you do, very often you never really get a chance to hold a bird in the hand. And so it's always a special experience for a lot of these biologists for the first time to actually hold a piping plover um, and get excited about piping plover. So that was uh, always a great experience for me. Um, and then one of the last projects I worked on with Dr. Charles Clarkson, it was for about eight years or well, five years of collecting data with a bunch of volunteers. And maybe some of you in the audience helped collect those data. It ended up being the, the breeding bird atlas for the state of Rhode Island. So that was uh, a lot of fun to work on. So uh, one of my passions really um, for about the last 11 years is um, working with terns on Great Gull Island. So if you don't know where Great Gull Island is, uh, it's about eight miles off of New London, Connecticut, it, just west of Fishers Island. Um, it's about 17 acres. It has about 10,000, excuse me, 11,000 pairs of common terns and 2,000 pairs of roseate terns, which is a federally endangered species. So it's one of the largest tern colonies in, in uh, the Atlantic coast. Um, it's a very special place to work. Um, and if you've never had a chance to go and be in a tern colony, this picture I took at Monomoy National Wildlife Refuge is pretty expect spectacular to see the birds. Um, it's a, especially in the spring when they're settling into the island, they go and spend the night on offshore and then they'll come in and they don't, it takes them a while for them to just want to stay on the island um, all day long. And so particularly at nighttime, you'll see these large flocks of birds flying offshore. Um, it's pretty incredible to be in the midst of it. Or two, when you're just, two, when the, when the terns are coming in um, in, in the breeding colonies and getting to move, it's just a spectacular experience to be in the midst of all these thousands and thousands of terns. Uh, so this picture I took on Great Gull Island, and if you're the birders in the audience, the neat thing about Great Gull Island is there's so many roseate terns. And so the roseate terns are these birds with the really long tail. Um, there's only about 6,000, right now there's only about 6,000 pairs of roseate terns in the Northwest Atlantic and um, over 2,000 of them nest on Great Gull Island. So there's only three places in the Northwest where great, uh, roseate terns nest in large colonies. Um, so it's always a special experience to be able to work out there. So this is a common tern um, and roseate terns just to show the difference. And they, so they nest sympatrically, or they nest in the same islands. Roseate terns only nest where there's common terns, at least in the Northwest Atlantic. Um, and the reason for that is the common terns tend to be very aggressive. So when a predator comes in, um, they're very good at chasing off predators and they're also very aggressive towards other common terns and roseate terns too. So they're the defenders of the colony. Uh, and then the common terns, they nest in relatively open habitats is where they typically nest. Um, so this is a brood of common tern chicks. And the roseate terns, they nest in underneath rocks in very hidden things. So get away from predators for the most part. Uh, um, and so we can take advantage of that where we can build nest boxes for the roseate terns to increase the amount of nesting habitat available for the roseate terns. Um, and so when we've built hundreds and hundreds of, of nest boxes to increase the population on Great Isle Island, and we've increased the population there by over 25% by just building a bunch of nest boxes. Um, and then we end up with, these are young rosia tern chicks that were banned and we can keep track of their populations by color banding them too. Um, and this just shows 
So another thing we do all the time is bring out students from URI to help with these efforts to increase the nesting habitat. And then you end up with all these nest boxes and put out, and it's always good to put out the nest boxes in the next year, see all these roseate turned chicks produced from these nest boxes. So that's always a fun experience. So I just wanna say that, you know, the, in all of this, as Pete mentioned, the most exciting thing in my career is having the chance to work with all the students um, at URI and get them excited. They are excited about wildlife and get them more excited about giving the chance to hold wildlife and, and see the look in their eyes when they really get a chance to hold a wood duck for the first time or go out in a freezing <laughs> January day and go look for a snow goose in the middle of the Canada goose flock. Um, or maybe just go to Satuest Point National Wildlife Refuge and maybe see a snowy owl if you're lucky. And so that's ho hopefully a, a memory that will keep in everybody's lifetime for their lifetime. So uh, I'm remiss if I wouldn't uh, thank my family too. I, I want to apologize to my family. When I, so when I started out as an assistant professor, we didn't have much money. Um, so we didn't have any toys. So all we could do is catch birds and bring them home <laughs> for, the, for the kids to play with. So if they were lucky, they would get to catch an oven bird or a saw wet owl. And that was it. Um, and I do want to thank my lovely family for everything and, and everything I've gone through with me. And every, uh, it's been a spectacular um, growing up in Rhode Island and with my great family. So I'm so proud of everything that they, my daughters have accomplished and everything my wife has accomplished too. So, um, so I don't know what my career is going to take me from now. This is a picture of the sunset of my career. I do. I definitely want to say that I, a huge thank to all of my colleagues over the year, all the graduate students that I've worked with, all the undergraduate students that I've worked with. It's just been a complete honor and privilege to work with all of you. Um, it's been spectacular. And I don't know if I'm distinguished, but <laughs> um, I do want to thank you very much. The Rhode Island Natural History Survey presents videos to showcase the animals, plants, geology, and natural systems that surround us, and the people and organizations working to understand and conserve them.